In the business world, there is a familiar fable about a chicken and a pig. To illustrate the differences in the level of commitment that are involved for workers in a project. And it goes like this. A pig and a chicken are walking down the road and the chicken says, hey pig, we should open a restaurant. And the pig says, hmm, what do you want to call it? And the chicken says, how about ham and eggs? The pig thinks for a moment and says, yeah, no thanks. I'd be committed, but you'd only be involved. And the point of the fable is to show that there are two types of people in business. Pigs, who are totally committed and they're accountable for the outcome of the project, and then chickens who consult on the project and who are only informed of the process. And the bottom line is the chicken sacrifices nothing and the pig sacrifices everything. And for the next couple of weeks, we're looking at the difficult things that Jesus asked his followers to do, most specifically the commands that seem to be the most difficult. Perhaps commands that when we read them, make us squirm a little bit. So the question I just wanna ask you this morning is when it comes to your relationship with Jesus, are you a chicken or are you a pig? Are you committed only to the point that you're willing to make a contribution or are you all in to the point that you would sacrifice everything, even to sacrifice your life? That's the question that we'll be looking at this morning. Personally, me, I like, I like these verses. 1 Corinthians 15, what do I gain if, humanly speaking, I fought with beasts at Ephesus? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Luke 12, and I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. Isaiah 22, and behold, joy and gladness killing oxen and slaughtering sheep, eating flesh and drinking wine, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. We know that familiar phrase, right? Even outside the Bible, eat, drink, and be merry. Eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. We all want to live until we die, right? We all want to live until we die. And I think we could all make an argument for that. I think there are many people that would agree. We wanna seize the day, we wanna live for today, we wanna stop and smell the roses. We humans have a strong desire to extract all the value and all the vitality that you can get out of life before it's too late. Think of the people that we all look up to. We admire famous people, we admire accomplished people, we admire busy people and people who get things done, movers and shakers and folks who drive straight on through to their single-minded goal and they accomplish something. We admire the people that are dressed in the, the power suit, the person who gets up way too early and arrives to work early and the person who stays late and the person who's got a briefcase full of papers that they're pouring over through a really hurried lunch. We admire the folks that fill up their calendars with things to do, places to go, people to see. Live until you die. I admire that, don't you? Of course. Makes me tired, but I admire it. But have you ever thought about the opposite way to live? Have you ever thought about dying until you live? Jesus tells us to do that. In Matthew 16, Jesus tells his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. That's our next difficult command. Die to live. Die to live. Christians are people who die so they can live. Believers are people who've discovered that beyond all the hurriness and busyness and get up and go of the world, there is something more. Jesus says that there is a death that brings life. There is a dying that brings fulfillment and blessing. Live, live until you die is good but die until you live is even better. 
The Apostle Paul is going to expound on this a little bit more. In Colossians 3, he writes, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Who are Christians, according to Paul? People who have died, right? He says Christians are people who have died, but who have been raised to life in Christ. And then he says, and the new life is available right now. I, I know we always love sermons and stories about life after death and, and, and heaven, but how do we live now until then? The, the earth is not one just uh, giant waiting room where we all twiddle our thumbs and wait for glory. What about the life God has given to us right now? The life that we have right now. If we are willing to die right now. Die right now. What does that mean? What I'm, what I'm getting at. What do you mean by dying now in order to receive life? Because that's what we're talking about. Well, there are some clues, and we can find them here in this scripture. If you look at Colossians 3 again, continuing on in verse 5, Paul says, Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. What things? And he lists them out. Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Paul says, put to death. Put to death. Put to death what? A number of things. But at the heart of them, what do they all have in common? Desire. Greed. Wanting. Wanting what we want. Look at that list again. And don't just focus on the easy ones. Paul says, put all of it to death. Die to these things. Paul says, self-indulgence has to die. In our rush to accumulate things, to be successful, to be powerful, to have influence and have status and to have and to have and to have, we need to wake up to the reality that to live selfishly is not to live like Jesus. But the issue goes even deeper than that. Right after Paul tells us that we are to put to death the sin of self-indulgence, he moves on to another level. He also tells us that we have to die to all these abusive feelings. We have to put to death some attitudes. And again, the Bible is very specific if you look at verse 8. Colossians 3, 8 says, You must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Now, at first glance, this may seem like, oh, it's a new list. This is a new topic. But it's not. These attitudes still all stem from greed and from self-indulgence. What we want, what we desire, we need to have. And then what happens if somebody gets in our way? You know, when we're pushing for stuff and, and somebody else steps in front of us, ooh, they're, they're in for some trouble. You just try and compete with us. You better not get more than me. You better not get in my way. Because that's when tempers go up and our feelings get hurt. What does Paul say is the result? Anger, wrath, malice, slander, abusive lang language? Yeah, that sounds right. Self-indulgence is the wrong way to live. Because when you want and desire for yourself, and live for yourself, well then, gee, God help anyone who gets in your way. So in order for us to live, in order for society to live, these selfish, abusive attitudes have to die. What does Paul say next? I have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not 
Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free, but Christ is all and in all. Paul gives us good news now. He says life is possible. Authentic life is possible. It's within our reach and it's possible. When we die to self, we put on a new self. The message Jesus shares is die and follow me, right? Pick up your cross and follow me. Deny yourself and follow me. That's good news. That is good news because it means that we can have a new life right now in this moment before you go to heaven. And the followers of Jesus who heard these words, take up your cross, they would have immediately known what Jesus meant. Because in the Roman Empire, the cross is the instrument of death. So when Jesus tells his followers to take up their cross and follow him, he's telling them they need to die to their old way if they really want to live. Now, you and I, we don't live in a world of crosses. So maybe we have some difficulty grasping what cross means. But we know what it means to die to the old ways so that we can live in new ways. We can strip off the old self and we can clothe ourselves in something new. You can start by putting old to death, dying until you live. You know, every Sunday, I, I, I bet many of us enjoy dressing nice for church. We want to look fresh, we want to look clean. Frankly, I don't get to the store very often. For, for clothes, I, I just don't. I have been wearing the same suits and ties for years. And even though I'd probably enjoy new clothes, for me, the problem is my closet. You know, my chest of drawers, they're already full. My closet's full. So if I got something new, I would have to get rid of something old. There isn't room for both. So if I ever wanted a new blue suit, one that had maybe more modern fabric or a better cut, I would first have to get rid of my old blue suit. I would have to free up some closet space, free up the hanger. Okay, well, Jesus wants to clothe you in a new self. But in order to get that new self, you have to get rid of the old one. There is no room for both. This is what it means to die to live. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. So this idea of being transformed here means that we are becoming on the outside, this new person that Jesus has already made new on the inside. Our character and our conduct are being changed to reflect the inward change that has happened, the inward spirituality that has happened. And just one page back from that, Paul writes in chapter three, we all with unveiled face beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Now, it's important to notice here that this is a passive verb. He says we are being transformed, which means that somebody else is doing the work. Somebody else is doing the transforming. But at the same time, it's also a present tense command. So it's almost like allow yourself, you're doing part of it, allow yourself to be transformed. This, this is just like the phrase, take up your cross, right? We play a part. We do something, we take up our cross. Taking up your cross, that's an action. Being transformed, that's an action. And who is it that Paul says is transforming us? The Holy Spirit. That means we don't lift this cross or put on this new life alone. Titus 3, 5 says he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. Our human desire, our natural human desire, is always at war with the Holy Spirit. So we have to pray. 
that the Holy Spirit aligns our thoughts and our wills with God's thoughts. And as we deny ourselves, as we pick up our cross in prayer, we give God a chance to speak to us. He purifies our thoughts and he fine-tunes our will. And he gives us direction through the Holy Spirit. Dying to self means we stop following our instincts, our voice, and listen to his voice. Follow the Spirit. When you look at your own life, when you look at the life of your church family, do you see the work of the Spirit? Do you see yourself and your church rooted in God's truth, convicted of sin and pride, and living in humble submission to God? Do you see yourself and your church as healthy, fruitful Christians, overflowing with all the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control? Do you see the gifts of the Spirit at work in your life and the church at large? Do you see the power of God displayed? Do you see it transforming hearts and healing bodies? If I answer honestly, I would say, yeah, a bit, a bit, right? Not, not much. So there's a huge gap, right? There is. There's a huge gap between who we are and who we are called to be. And that gap is the power of the Holy Spirit. We need to stop relying on ourselves. We need to stop trying to live the Christian life by our own strength. And we need to surrender to the God who longs to dwell in and through us in order that he might change the world. We need to die to self. And to do that, we need to accept two things that don't make any sense, right? And the first one is that life comes only through death. That's what we've been saying, right? Life comes only through death. In John 12, Jesus says, unless a grain of wheat falls to the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Jesus is talking about wheat dying. This illustration is a lesson in agriculture. It, it's the basis for our spiritual life. The fact that wheat is ineffective when it's stored in a barn. It has to be planted in order to bring a crop. And the application, spiritually speaking, is that new life in Christ comes when we fully bury our control over life. Jesus uses the word fall, right? The word fall is applied to the wheat. And it carries this meaning in the, in the Greek of, of falling down, laying prostrate, laying flat on your face before God. If we want eternal life, there is death to pride in our life. There is submission in our life. We must admit that we have a need for a savior. How do we die to self? You hand yourself over to him. It's, it's a choice. It's free will. You know, it's just, the, it's the same in banking, right? You have, you have some money, you want to open a bank account, you research it, you decide on a local bank, you look it over, you study its financial you know, uh, statement and its security measures, you, you check the references of the board and their officers, and up, up until this point you have uh, reason and intellect, but until you take the plunge, until you hand your money over to the teller and they receive it from you, it took faith on your part to hand over your life savings. That is a leap of faith. That's required for eternal life. You have to leap into saying that the old life is dead. Paul says you crucify the old you and you follow Christ. You believe that God raised Jesus from the dead and you believe that he'll do the same for you. You accept his finished work of salvation and you receive new life. And then the second, just totally absurd, contradictory statement, but it's true, is following is leading. Following is leading. After we pick up our cross, 
Jesus says, follow me. But following and servanthood are words that people aren't interested in these days. Everybody wants to be a leader, right? But you know, even Jesus modeled what following and serving looked like. Jesus was a servant leader. Matthew 20 says, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for, for many. That phrase, but to serve, is a compound word. The first part of that word means to wait on. And that's where we get our English church word, deacon, right? Or servant. And the other word literally means that it's a coming together in the road. So Jesus is saying something like, join me on the road to service. But the world in which we live says the opposite. It says, grab on, hold tightly, squeeze everything you can out of life. And Jesus teaches a paradox that you can never really touch the things that you reach for. You cannot keep the things that you are holding. The moment you think you've piled up this good life for yourself and you've made your mark, that's when it comes crashing down. In wanting to be served, you lose everything. Sadly, we always think that I can fix this with willpower, right? I don't, I don't need to follow. I need to lead. I don't need God. I don't need the Spirit. I don't need to die to self. I can do this on my own. We keep thinking that throwing myself at life with more and more and more effort, and I don't know what it is I need, but maybe it's more wisdom or more money or more and more, somehow that'll tip the scale in your favor. Is it working? It hasn't for me. I keep missing the target of life. When I get, when I, you know, everything I get back, my returns, they're only slightly more than what I gave. So I, it feels like I can't ever get ahead. And I don't feel like I really am living. So maybe eat, drink, and be merry, that's, that's the lie. Because I've been doing it for years and it hasn't worked. Maybe it's time to die to live. To lead by following. Maybe it's time to go all in, full commitment. To pick up my cross and to follow. Let's pray. Lord, once again, we are confronted with a difficult teaching. And these are not the Bible verses we like. They make us uncomfortable and we squirm in our seats. And we think, I'm doing okay. I'm, I'm, I'm doing everything else but this. I think we hope that you'll turn a blind eye to the fact that there are some things that we just have difficulty obeying that your grace covers all. But these are difficult because there are changes in how we live and how we think. And many of us don't like change. Many of us don't like rocking the boat. Many of us don't like the attention that it brings. But you have commanded us to die to self, to put on the new life, that's what it means to be a Christian, to be a new person. Not just a cleaner version of the old, but a completely new person. Lord, may we humble ourselves in your sight so that you will lift us up. May we recognize the need for a savior. May we learn more and more what it means to to die to self, to take up our cross and follow, no matter how difficult. In the time that we have, we want to live for you and to become more and more like your son each day. Amen. Well, thanks for coming out and 
worshiping with us today. Of course, I would remind you that uh, we're here in Montgomery. Uh, we're just off Walden Road, and we have two services every Sunday for you. Uh, we have a 930 service, which is our traditional service. We have a choir. We're going to sing hymns. We're going to do responsive readings. We're going to take communion. It's going to feel just like the church that you grew up in. And then at 11 o'clock, that's our Sunday school hour. We have a full Sunday school program for everybody from birth all the way through adults. We also have our contemporary service where we would ask you to just come however you feel casual, come comfortable, and you can worship with our worship team. We're going to have fun and fellowship and love the Lord. We want to be the church where you live. I'll see you guys soon. Bye.